Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm Carly Andres, Senior Project Coordinator for the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. We hold these Web Wednesdays every other Wednesday from 1 30 to 3. Um, so everything, the recording for today, as well as the link for CEUs will be up um, usually by the end of the week at the later, like Friday end of work day um, on the same area where you found out how to get into here. Um, we have them scheduled now till um, through the new year. So keep joining us throughout these as winter starts. Um, but I'm very excited to have Dr. Kevin Fire here today. I'm going to just read his bio to you guys. He is a, uh, has a BA in speech pathology and audiology from the University of Akron, Ohio, an MA in audiology from the University of Akron, and a doctorate in speech and hearing science audiology from the Ohio State University. He is board certified in audiology and a fellow of the American Academy of Audiology. He has completed a clinical fellowship in audiology in Euclid, Ohio, and has also completed a one-year traineeship in audiology with the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. He is licensed in North Dakota, both as an audiologist and as a hearing instrument specialist. He has authored several book chapters in academic texts and very, about various topics in audiology and has research articles published in a number of journals. Dr. Fire is an associate professor of audiology and has taught audiology and hearing instrument technology for 20 years at the university level, two years at Ohio State, and 18 years at UND. Dr. Fire has also received university-wide awards for excellence in teaching three times in his academic career, once at OSU and twice at UND. Dr. Fire is a clinician who has significant experience in the assessment and treatment of auditory processing difficulties as well as tinnitus. He is the owner of Fire Audiology and Hearing Center in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Thank wow. You so much. An impressive bio you have. Um, <laughs> Sounds like so my I mom love to really see that you were I love to see that you were at Ohio State because we use the Ohio State as our screening a tool that we use. We okay. it's called the modified OSU and um Dr. Corgan. I don't know if you ever worked with him at all, but he was the brain guy that we work with. Um over there and we got to meet him at a conference recently but um awesome yeah awesome and i and i actually uh minored i had a minor in statistics research design and neuropsychology when i was oh, okay at uh, ohio state mainly because uh, i got over into the neurosciences department to take some classes and just really got interested in what they had to say just had some great teachers over there but you know the university is so huge it's sort of bigger than grand forks that right there would be a lot of faculty members there that i just sure. really didn't have a reason to cross paths with but, yeah uh, yeah we yeah. quote some of his studies quite a bit he does a lot of research like with rats where they damage their brains and then kind of see what happens and that kind of stuff so you bet, you bet. Yeah, well, well, well thank, thanks for right. the invitation yes fun to, fun to get online here and do some sort of remote teaching i'm actually now an associate professor emeritus of audiology because uh some years ago i just got too busy to do both the full-time academic uh, position that i had as well as my clinical position that i have here at my clinic and i have another clinic out in lakota north dakota um, and so, you know, I really kind of had to, had to decide where was I going to spend the majority of my time. But I have gone back, especially through COVID, for a couple of years and taught three or four classes uh, every year. Just wasn't doing some of the other faculty responsibilities when I was over there at, uh, at UND. So, so I've, I've enjoyed teaching. That was kind of the most fun part of the job. And, and tinnitus or tinnitus, depending upon who you talk to, and that actually my last patient before I was coming in here at 1.30, said, I mentioned I was going to be doing a talk on tinnitus. And he said, well, I call it tinnitus. Who's right? And I said, well, the answer is both of us are, uh, because both are completely acceptable pronunciations uh, of, the, of, this, of this symptom that lots and lots of people experience. Um, and so I'll kind of just start the slideshow and kind of continue to uh, just kind of continue to, to talk. And Again, I'll ask, you know, Carly, if for some reason my audio drops or something becomes a little fritzy, just call out to me and I'll see if I can't fix this here. Um, but, you know, this is a talk, I kind of have this one a little more maybe uh, based, a little less medically based. 
Um, I do have one that's a little more medically based that I will give as well. But but you notice that I, I really kind of named this one the phantom pain of the auditory system, because really that's a very good analogy to what tinnitus, by the way, most audiologists say tinnitus, but I'll back and forth, I'll go back and forth from tinnitus to tinnitus, just because I understand lots of people do say that. Um, but really it is very much like a phantom pain. And anyone who has known someone who experiences a phantom pain um, will have a pretty good analogy to what tinnitus is. So what phantom pain is, is I always like to tell my patients, nature hates a vacuum. Your central auditory system in all the sensory systems, the visual system, the auditory system, the tactile system, proprioception, um, all of those sensory systems hate for any information to be missing. And so for individuals, for instance, who have lost a limb due to an injury of some type, um, either due to, I had a friend who lost a limb because he had bone cancer, so they had to sacrifice his leg. Um, I've you know, known individuals who've been in motor vehicle accidents and have lost a limb. Obviously, individuals who've had a traumatic injury like uh, an IED explosion when they're in the service, for instance, um, you know, can lose a limb. And one of the real common problems after that is individuals will have abnormal sensations from that limb that is no longer there. Uh, and that sensation can be burning, it can be pain, it can be a sensation of a cramp, um, because the brain is basically saying, you know, I'm missing some sensory information. So I'm going to create my own sensory information to fill in that missing information. Well, let's talk a little bit about other things, other ways we may experience something that's kind of like tinnitus. Um, so for instance, let's say you get your picture taken. So you're looking at someone and they use a flash and you look away and you see an after image in your visual system. Um, well, that image is not really there, but yet you see it. And why are you seeing that? And the answer is the nerve endings on your retina have become overstimulated by that bright flash They've really got to shut down for a while to kind of repolarize themselves or recharge. And as they're doing that, they're not firing off in any normal way. So what's your brain say? Oh, I'm missing some sensory information. I better fill that in with something else. And it fills that in with a visual after image. It's not really there. It is essentially sort of a phantom visual image. Let's say you sit wrong on the couch. So you're sitting at home tonight and you're doing paperwork or whatever, and you're sitting with your legs crossed one foot under your other leg. And after a while, you start feeling a pins and needles effect in your foot. And of course, we usually say, hey, my foot went to sleep. Well, what's happened is you have decreased the amount of neural information that is coming from that limb, in this case, your foot, to your brain. What did I say about three minutes ago? Nature hates a vacuum. It hates having reduced sensory input and in this case, your brain tries to fill it back in, tends to overdo it because it gives you that kind of pins and needles effect until you kind of shake your foot awake again and get that neural information going back up to the brain. And what happens is your brain says, now I'm getting this normal neural information. I don't have to do the pins and needles anymore. And it goes away. So now let's think about what tinnitus or tinnitus is. This is a perception of sound that is not there. So it is in effect a phantom sound, a phantom sensory stimulus. And why does that occur? And what we're gonna learn about in the talk today is it's often indicative of an area in the auditory system that has been damaged in some way, thereby reducing the sensory input to the brain. Well, what have we said the last three examples I gave you, nature hates a vacuum. The brain hates that there is a missing auditory sensory information coming to it. So what's it do? It starts to create its own phantom stimulus. And in this case, since the neural pathways are encoded for sound, not vision, not tactile, not other sensory systems, but it, it's encoding sound, your brain essentially creates a sound to fill in the missing auditory information. And what is that? It's a term we have, we, it, it is a condition we have termed tinnitus or tinnitus. So we have other examples of these sensory sort of phantom stimuli. Phantom pain is one, your foot going to sleep, the visual after image from a bright flash, 
In this case, though, we have something that's causing abnormalities in, sense, in the sensory system of the auditory system. Brain fills that in with sound. And I'll often tell my patients, you know, that I understand now this is a noxious uh, symptom that they want to get rid of. And the example I'll use with that is I'll say, if you have a hearing loss, generally that's kind of like your foot going numb on you. You are missing sensory input. If on the other hand, you have tinnitus or tinnitus, now there is a noxious uh, symptom that you wanna get rid of. I'll say the, the, that that is more like having a pebble in your shoe. People are much more motivated to remove that noxious sensory uh, stimulus than they are to replace something that may be missing for them. So that's really my kind of introduction to what it is we're talking about when we're talking about tinnitus or tinnitus and kind of where does it come from? It originates in the brain. It is not originating in the ear. It is the brain's reaction to some abnormal function along that auditory neural pathway. Um, we learned that much to our chagrin many years ago when one of the ways people tried to treat tinnitus was to cut the auditory nerve. They'd say, well, gosh, if you have this horrible ringing in your ears that you just can't get along uh, with, we're gonna go ahead and sever the nerve and make it go away. Well, if you've been following my logic, guess what happens? Generally, it makes it worse because nature hates that vacuum we have just applied to it. So anyway, that is kind of my, my beginning of, uh, of, of what the talk is about. And really, if you wanted to have sort of a summary of the things we're gonna talk about, a lot of it's in really that introduction. By the way, I now just turned on my laser pointer. It's always funny to see all these letters after people's last names. One time I was doing a talk, this is a true story. I was doing a talk for the United States Army one time on essentially noise-induced hearing loss and why it is that individuals in the military tend to develop hearing loss because of noise exposure. And I was in front of a room of a bunch of people. And finally, one of the gentlemen in the room who happened to be a colonel, I think he was the ranking member in the room, he raised his hand and he said, I know what Kevin Fire, that's your name. And I know what PhD means. But what are those letters after that? Were those your grades? <laughs> he thought we had to put the grades of the classes we took. Three C's, one A, one F, and three A's. He said, what'd you get the F in? So, but that was from my, my bio. That's the Certificate of Clinical Competence in Audiology and a fellow of the American Academy of Audiology. So if any of you out there were wondering, but were too polite to ask, those were not my grades in school. So, uh, so anyway, so let's kind of go on and start looking. Let's start by looking at the, at the external ear. Because often when tinnitus, tinnitus occurs, it is due to some abnormality in the peripheral auditory system. Although when we start talking about head injuries or brain injuries, we also realize that it potentially can arise from damage in the auditory centers that are in the central auditory nervous system as well. But this is the peripheral system. The ear is a very complicated organ, really has four major parts to it. Where you see my laser pointer right now, um, and if you kind of read up here, it says, you know, from the eardrum or the tympanic membrane outward, that's what's called the external ear. And the external ear is the part you can see, you know, you can see it on the side of your head. It sells lots of jewelry, holds my glasses up, um, doesn't do an awful lot in terms of hearing. The external ear really allows the more kind of the more fragile components of the auditory system to be embedded within the bones of the skull, particularly the temporal bone. So if we look here, we see really just kind of a, a flap of kind of cartilage and skin that leads to a tube called the ear canal or the external auditory meatus. It's really just a sound pathway that allows these more delicate structures to be down inside and protected by bone. So the next section, what is called the middle ear section, starts at the eardrum. It includes the three smallest bones in your body, which we call kind of, uh, if we talk about them um, generally, we call them the ossicles or the ossicular chain. They have three names. You may have heard of them as kind of the hammer, anvil, and stirrup when you were taking anatomy maybe back in school. We would call those the malleus, incus, and stapes. The stapes kind of looks like a stirrup. I don't think the malleus and the incus look like a hammer and an anvil, but that's just kind of a colloquial term for those. So we have the eardrum connected to the three smallest bones in your body. 
those little bones are about the size of a grain of rice. So to give you kind of the context of how small of structures we're looking at here, these are quite small and they're hanging in an air-filled space. The middle ear space is an air-filled space here. Um, lots of you may have, have, have children or have known of children that have had issues with maybe middle ear issues that need tubes in their ears. That's generally because this middle ear air-filled space fills up with fluid and it doesn't drain well out of this tube here that leads to the throat called the eustachian tube. So outer ear just conducts sound inward. Middle ear continues to conduct the sound inward, but what it also does is it actually allows us to take all of this sound energy that's hitting the eardrum, and the eardrum's pretty big relative to this little stirrup here, it's about 18 times as big. The eardrum is about 18 times as big as the bottom of that stirrup. And what that allows us to do is kind of like if you've taken a magnifying glass out on a sunny day, you can set leaves on fire with it. You can take light from a large area, focus it down to a very small area, and that will increase that light's intensity. So this allows us to take sound energy over a large area and focus it down to a very small area and that's going to increase the sound pressure there that we are then going to be going into the inner ear with. Uh, another example I use if there's mostly, mostly people in the uh, audience who are, who are women, um, if you've ever worn high heels out on a yard, you realize you can end up aerating your yard because the heel is gonna pierce into the ground. Well, that's not because you weigh anymore, it's because it's taking that force of your body weight and focusing it down to a very small area, which increases the pressure significantly. So we are taking a large area, focusing it down to a small area. That's really the purpose of the middle ear is to increase that sound pressure to let the sound go into the inner ear. And particularly, the inner ear, this coiled tube where I'm kind of going with my laser pointer over here called the cochlea um, is where we're going to talk about a lot of things occur that will lead to tinnitus or tinnitus. This part of the inner ear, by the way, the part, this always looks like a snail to me. So I always think this is kind of the head of the snail with the antenna and so on up here. This is the balance portion of the inner ear. So your inner ear has two parts. It has what's called the vestibular portion where I'm pointing now and the cochlear portion, where I'm pointing at this point, the cochlear portion is where we hear, the vestibular portion is for our balance. So, but we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about where we hear. In addition, there is kind of a fourth part of the peripheral system, which is the auditory nerve itself that leaves the inner ear and goes on to the brain structures. That is the eighth cranial nerve, is the auditory nerve, sometimes called the auditory vestibular nerve, because there's a balanced balance branch to it and a hearing branch to it as well. So we have sound goes down a tunnel, vibrates an eardrum, which causes these bones to vibrate and focus that energy down to a very small area, which then sets up some vibration that occurs in this cochlear channel or this kind of coiled tube. And the next now the next slide, if we go back, we're gonna take a close up look at this cochlea, at this coiled tube, and then we're gonna cut across it. So this is that coiled tube that we've kind of taken a cross section of. We sliced across it, and now we're actually gonna look into, essentially this is, this is one continuous tunnel. So if you kind of took some Play-Doh and took it and rolled it around about two and three quarters turns, if you then sliced through that Play-Doh, you could see you're just looking in one part of that coiled tube now. So these aren't different coiled tubes. That's, that's different places along that same coiled tube. And as we look in there, we see there's really three tunnels. There's a tunnel called scala vestibuli, a tunnel called scala media, and a tunnel called scala tympani. So there's basically two membranes in there. I'm going across one membrane now called the tectorial membrane, the other one, which is called the basilar membrane. Those two membranes divide that tunnel into really three tunnels. And we're going to spend now our time looking at that middle tunnel, scala media. Scala media, do you see this little kind of organ here? It's called the organ of Cordy. We're now going to zoom in on that. And we're going to see that there are little nerve endings that are on top of little nerve cells. 
So I'm just kind of pointing at these nerve cells and they have little kind of nerve branches off the top of them. Those nerve endings are called hair cells. The reason they're called hair cells, because under a microscope, they look like little hairs. That's literally how they got their name. Um, just like in your retina of your eye, you have your rods and cones. The only reason they call them rods and cones is if you look under a microscope, they look like rods and cones. So they wasn't being very creative when they named them. But we see that there are these little nerve endings here. Where tinnitus comes from. So this is why I wanted to talk a little bit about the anatomy here, is when an individual is exposed to either acoustic trauma or an injury of some type or advancing age or viruses and so on, this will lead to damages. This will damage these nerve endings or these what are called hair cells. And what happens is those hair cells or nerve endings are tuned to different pitches of sound, different frequencies. As a matter of fact, at this part of the cochlea is where we hear our high pitch sounds. At this part, kind of these, this part of the tunnel is where we hear our mid pitch sounds. And this part is where we hear our low pitch sounds up at what's called the apical end near the helicotrema. So we hear kind of low pitches, middle pitches, and high pitches. And what happens when there is damage to the auditory system is these nerve endings either get killed off or detached from their membrane. And that leads to that essentially reduction in sensory input. And as I said, now probably 10 minutes ago, the brain hates it when sensory input is missing. And so what it will do is create its own phantom sound. We call that tinnitus or tinnitus. And almost always that matches where the nerve ending damage is greatest. So when a person comes in, and I do, for instance, a tinnitus evaluation with them, I will often present different tones to them and say, let me know when these tones sound to you like your tinnitus. And when I match it up, almost always, that is where the greatest damage in their auditory system is occurring. Okay? So I just wanted you to have a little bit of an idea of how the ear works, because if what we're talking about with tinnitus is we have damaged something, so therefore something isn't working. What's really happening here? We have killed, generally killed off or detached nerve endings. Now, in the case of a head injury, we also can have some damage to the nerve, more the nerve um, neural network that can occur up in the central nervous system, particularly in the temporal lobe, in a place called Heschel's gyrus, which is kind of on the side of the brain. If there is damage to that lobe, to the temporal lobe, that will lead to, again, some abnormal perceptions of sound and the brain doesn't like that and reacts to that by creating these phantom sounds that we call tinnitus. So again, it can occur due to peripheral damage, damage out in the cochlea itself, in the peripheral auditory system. And that would be things like noise exposure, aging, viruses, and so on. And tinnitus can also occur due to damage in the neural pathways, the auditory neural pathways, when they reach the central nervous system, particularly up in the, uh, up in the temporal lobe in an area called Heschel's gyrus. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about hearing loss, because hearing loss and tinnitus often go hand in hand. About 85% of people who have ringing in their ears have hearing loss as well. They may not know they have hearing loss, particularly if they're focused on the, on the tinnitus that they're experiencing. But they, when we test them, one of the first things we do is try to determine, hey, is there a peripheral hearing loss that may be causing this? Because the treatment is somewhat different if it's a peripheral hearing loss versus some other abnormality in the auditory system. But lots of people have hearing loss who don't know they have hearing loss. And the reason is, number one, you don't see it. So that's my next little line, it's invisible, just don't see it. Um, number two, hearing loss is generally without pain. Now there are exceptions to that. Obviously if the hearing loss is due to an ear infection or due to a big trauma of some type, an explosion or something, there can certainly be pain associated with that. But when it is hearing loss that's, ex that's due to long-term noise exposure, aging, viruses, a vascular cause of some type, meaning that the, uh, the blood supply has been interrupted, almost like a little mini stroke in the auditory system. These are not things that cause discomfort or pain. 
And often, and again, lots of these things say usually and often, often hearing loss is slow in its onset. Not always. Um, individuals who, again, are exposed to a traumatic explosion of some type. Now, that's kind of an instantaneous cause to a hearing loss. Um, if an individual has a, an interruption in the blood supply, uh, a vasospasm, which is going to interrupt the blood flowing into the inner ear, the cochlear artery, um, that hearing loss can come on in minutes rather than years. Uh, but oftentimes, as people are advancing in age, their hearing loss is declining, and it just becomes the new normal to them. So lots of patients come in and say, you know, boy, I have significant ringing in my ears, and we'll question them about their hearing, and they'll say, no, I think my hearing's pretty good. And then we'll test them and find out, well, their hearing really isn't very good, and that may be where that tinnitus or tinnitus is coming from. So again, often it's often called an invisible uh, disability simply because it's not something that is obviously seen by other people, okay? And the other thing is, it's often more bothersome to other people. It's often the people who, are, who have the hearing loss, they've learned to cope with it, whereas other individuals are having much more difficulty with them. You, I can't tell you how many times I have patients who say, well, I hear you when you talk to me, you know, they're speaking to their spouse, and their spouse says, yeah, it's the fifth time I called your name. Well, to the person with the hearing loss, it was the first time they heard it. So they thought it was only once. So it's often something that is not particularly um, bothersome to the patient with the loss of hearing. Um, it's often other people who are affected more by this. And, and that's something we'll often counsel patients. We'll say, you don't think you're doing very poorly, but clearly your family does it's probably time for you to treat this, if, at least for them, if not, if not for yourself, at least for them. Uh, and the nice thing is, again, with lots of people with, you know, 75 to 80% of people have ringing in their ears also have hearing loss, lots of the strategies we use to treat hearing loss can be very helpful in the case of tinnitus as well, okay? So where do people get hearing loss? Noise exposure is the biggest one, either through an acoustic trauma which is a single high intensity sound. This is the patient who shows up in my office who says, I was deer hunting the other day in a blind and my son saw a deer coming and he didn't warn me to put my hearing protection in. And I was sitting right next to him and the rifle went off and you know, almost knocked me to, my, you know, to, to the floor. Uh, and now I've got ringing in my ears and I can't hear and so on. That's a single high intensity event causing, notice it says a conductive, and or a sensory neural hearing loss. All a conductive loss means is it is something in that outer or middle ear system. So if it was through the ear canal, the eardrum, those little bones, that's a conductive loss. If it's in the damage in the nerve endings, the hair cells, that's a sensory loss or sensory neural hearing loss. If it's both, by the way, which can happen, we call that a mixed hearing loss. Um, or noise-induced, long-term noise-induced hearing loss, this is more that person who, you know, they're always mowing the lawn, but they won't, don't wear hearing protection or they're riding their Harley with straight pipes and they don't wear a helmet or hearing protection or they work at a loud job uh, and so on. The accumulation of, of losing a few nerve endings kind of every day eventually just adds up to the point that this leads to a hearing loss and very likely tinnitus as well, okay? So what noise does is it can actually cause those nerve endings to become swollen, just kind of injured, just like if you twist your anchor, ankle and your uh, ankle swells up due to some edema, uh, this can be a temporary condition. And usually within about two weeks, that swelling will go down and their hearing will come back, maybe not all the way, but it will often improve. And we call that a temporary threshold shift, as opposed to the hair cells becoming destroyed or becoming detached from those membranes maybe not completely killed, but just kind of torn loose, that would be a permanent threshold shift or a permanent hearing loss that we would find. And again, I don't know if I mentioned this in my preamble, but we think that noise exposure is the number one cause of tinnitus. Uh, probably aging is number two, with head injuries being num the number three cause for, for uh, hearing loss. And by the way, if the trauma occurred as part of a motor vehicle accident, Lots of times we will attribute that to, you know, the whiplash effect or a strike on the head, which may have led to some uh, injury to the brain. The other thing we need to remember is airbags that are deploying in a wreck um, are incredibly loud. 
As a matter of fact, what deploys an airbag is a shotgun shell. So if you think about it, if a person has been in a car accident that has led to airbag deployment, they've been in a closed environment inside their car with a gunshot going off with them. So even though sometimes we think, gosh, the car wreck must have caused the, the tinnitus or tinnitus because of an impact injury or something like that, sometimes it is a noise-induced or a, an acoustic trauma event from the airbag deployment that can do this as well. Um, and we all know uh, motor vehicle accidents are very, very common reasons for, for head injuries. Um, uh, so these, are, these are just things that often make us a little more nervous of the cause um, if somebody doesn't have any other, um, any other kind of reasons for hearing loss to occur and it suddenly comes on, these are hearing losses that occur kind of in minutes to maybe hours. Uh, sudden hearing losses scare us a little bit because a lot of times there are vascular causes for those. And we do almost treat that kind of like um, a small stroke uh, and wanna get them in and get a vascular study done and so on. Also, if their loss doesn't seem to ever stop, if it's getting worse and worse over time, um, that's a little bit of a warning sign for us. Um, fluctuating hearing loss, getting worse and getting better, um, can often mean there are some issues with, with fluid pressure abnormalities, a condition called Meniere's disease. And if the tinnitus is very loud, buzzing or roaring, um, that often means that there's damage kind of along the entire auditory pathway. And we're gonna take a pretty close look at that as well. I just wanted to show you what we, what we use as our basic behavioral hearing test. Most of you have probably seen an audiogram before. It's really a chart of hearing sensitivity going from left to right. I'm gonna move this at the bottom if I can. Uh, let me just bring this up uh, because I wanna show you the, uh, this is called an audiogram. So at the bottom we see frequency or pitch. Um, as we go from left to right, we see the numbers go up. Um, I always tell people it's like you're sitting in front of a piano. As you go from the left side of the piano keyboard to the right side of the piano keyboard, you are going up in pitch, low pitched keys to the left, high pitched keys to the right. From top to bottom, you're going from quiet sounds at the top. These are decibels. So notice the decibels are low at the top and kind of big at the bottom, which means an individual required more decibels before they pushed a button or raised their hand. So the further down these symbols appear on a graph, the greater the degree of hearing loss. The red or the right ear are the red circles, the X's are the left ear. You can probably see that in the low pitches, this person hearing, this person's hearing is pretty good. It was in the range of normal. But as we get up into the high pitches, we see a pretty substantial or a severe hearing loss. And I can guess with a pretty high level of certainty, where would this person be perceiving their tinnitus? About 6,000 Hertz. If we were to match that and I would play sounds to them, when I got to about 6,000 Hertz in between 4,000 and 8,000 Hertz, they will often tell me, boy, that sounds just like the ringing in my ears. Why? Because the brain is looking at where the sensory input is the most impoverished and it is creating that sound to fill in that blank, okay? So I would be very surprised if that patient uh, ended up telling me the tinnitus uh, that we were matching it at 500 Hertz or a thousand Hertz. That's so far away from where their hearing loss is at their worst, okay? So let's go to the next slide. There we go. So we can just say it is a perception of noise in the absence of acoustic stimulus. It is a phantom auditory perception. One thing I have not mentioned yet is there is something called objective tinnitus as well. These, the tinnitus that we see over 90% of the time, probably over 95% of the time, is what is called subjective tinnitus, meaning only the individual with the tinnitus can perceive it. Um, there are cases of objective tinnitus, though, where the tinnitus can be heard by others. Most commonly, that is going to have a muscular, uh, a muscular cause, some kind of a vibration in a muscular part of their ear. Um, we will see that fairly commonly in like multiple sclerosis. They'll have a condition called um, tensor tympani syndrome or palatal myoclonic contractions and so on. Um, and, and also, if there is a stricture 
uh, in a blood vessel, you can end up getting some objective tinnitus there because you're actually hearing the turbulence of the blood flowing through the blood vessels. But the vast majority of the time, this is a perception of noise that only the person who's experience it, experiencing it can hear. And it's a phantom auditory perception. About 40 million Americans have it. And about 25% of those people, so for about 10 million people, this interferes with their function. It either makes it difficult to fall asleep, um, it may add additional um, uh, noises that they have to listen through, and we all know how difficult it is to hear in noise anyway. Um, lots and lots of other sort of psychological issues, they can get quite anxious because of this, because it is a, a noxious stimulus that they cannot get away from. Um, and again, this is the pebble in the shoe, but you can't take your shoe off. You just got to learn to deal with it. That can be very frustrating for people. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about how we can work with this and how we can um, treat it, if not cure it. So, okay. Oh, that was my next slide. An objective tinnitus is the one that can be heard by other people. Usually we're going to have a muscular or vascular cause for that. Subjective tinnitus, only the patient hears it that's one that's probably going to have a neurogenic cause, caused by either damage in the peripheral nervous system of the auditory pathways, or in a head injury case, due to damage in the central auditory nervous system. And that may be due to some swelling effects. It may be due to uh, essentially some damage in the actual nerve cells themselves. But the brain just hates when there is damage in that pathway, and it will create its own stimulus to fill in that blank. Okay? Um, these are the, some, just some objective tinnitus. And we'll just quickly run through this. These are some causes for a tinnitus that other people can hear. Um, sometimes if their eustachian tube never closes, that's called a patchless eustachian tube. You can actually hear noises from their throat that can come up into their ear. Um, you can end up seeing uh, individuals who have uh, spasms in one of the muscles in the ear is called the stapedius muscle or the actual muscle that opens the eustachian tube is a palatal muscle called the tensor veli palatini. You can end up with kind of a twitch in that muscle. That's the palatal myoclonus. People with TMJs can also get tinnitus as well. Um, and whether again, that tends to be muscular caused or not, we're not really sure about that, but TMJ can lead to some irritations that can make people um, experience tinnitus as well. Um, there are vascular causes. You can have tumors that can occur upon um, uh, blood vessels. One of the most common ones is what's called a glomus jugular tumor. This is a person who presents uh, in my clinic, and I see maybe a couple of these a year, um, who says their heart is beating in their ear very regularly and very loud. Um, and we'll look down their ear canal and we'll see a blue mass behind the eardrum. This, uh, the glomus bodies on your jugular vein are basically chemoreceptors. They help us for instance, when we yawn, those are actually these glomus bodies detecting too much carbon dioxide in our blood, uh, and they lead to us wanting to ventilate more, get more oxygen. Those, those uh, little chemoreceptors can end up growing into a neoplasm or a tumor, and they can move up into the middle ear space. Um, we can end up with people who have just sort of some malformations of the arteries or the veins of their head and neck. Um, which we will often send them for then having uh, an MRI can pick that up generally, not a CT scan, but an MRI. Angiograms can do that uh, and so on. So, and then the, they can go in there and actually kind of clean those up, burn up where those little, um, where those little uh, uh, abnormalities can be in the art arteries and veins. Uh, an individual who has uh, a problem in the carotid artery, uh, either a narrowing or a stricture of the carotid artery, or what's called a dissection of the, uh, of the carotid artery where you can get some scar tissue that can kind of set up in there. Those will also lead to a, a tinnitus that we can hear. And basically I've, I've, what I will often do if someone comes in with a tinnitus that I suspect is either muscular or vascular, I'll actually put a microphone down by their eardrum, hook it up to a computer and just listen in their ear canal for a while and see if we can hear it as well. And if we can, that's very good. Um, evidence that that really is due to a problem, again, either in the blood, the, uh, the blood vessels or in the musculature down there. Um, and you can have kind of, a, kind of a constant humming sound. It's not as pulsatile. And that can sometimes be associated, again, with high blood pressure, thyroid disease, 
Uh, and if the top of kind of where the curve of the jugular vein is too close to the middle ear, sometimes that's audible to people as well. Okay. These are just tests we do, not really necessary for you folks to know that. These would be more what the audiologist would give if individuals come in with a complaint of tinnitus. I probably see 20 patients a week who are referred to me with a primary complaint of tinnitus. Um, and I will do a thorough uh, diagnostic site of lesion test battery with them. Uh, because again, I'm trying not just to rule in that it's damage in the nerve endings that this is leading to, uh, that is leading to this, but I'm also trying to rule out other causes that may have other treatments. For instance, again, a, a vascular cause of some type, um, a condition called Meniere's disease or endolymphatic high drops. That's due to abnormal fluid pressures in the inner ear. That's typically treated with a diuretic of some type. Um, individuals who may have a condition called otosclerosis, which shows up very well on the audiogram. Um, that's a person who has calcium deposits around that little, that little um, stirrup looking bone. And if you get calcium deposits there, about 90% of the patients who have calcium deposits will experience tinnitus. Uh, and the theory is because some of those calcium ions leak into the inner ear fluids and cause some irritation there, damaging those nerve endings, which leads to tinnitus. How do we treat that? Well, if it's very severe, they can be treated surgically, but if it's not very severe, there are supplements they can take uh, to try and seal off those calcium deposits that are there. So when I do a tinnitus evaluation for a patient, I'm not just trying to rule in that this is nerve damage and how we're gonna treat that, but let's make sure it isn't one of these other causes that should be treated better in another way, okay? Um, so, Tinnitus, if we can find a cause for it, um, we can eliminate that cause. You know, a patient walks in, you know, that's, that's a very happy patient when they come in and they have, let's, let's just say this is a person who was in a motor vehicle accident and they had a head injury and they started getting very severe ringing in their ears afterwards. And when they come in, it turns out that one of the things that happened was they had an injury in their middle ear space, which caused their middle ear to fill up with fluid now they're having something called an occlusion effect, which will allow them even if, to, to basically hear tinnitus at a much, much higher or much worse level. Well, in that case, if we find out that that is a fluid-filled middle ear space, we send them off to the ENT for, the, for a, a treatment called a myringotomy. That middle ear gets drained, tinnitus goes away. You have a very happy patient then. So if we can find these individual causes, a tumor, um, you know, the glomus, uh, glomus jugular tumors are surgically treatable. Um, I have seen people who have had bad tinnitus simply because of an imp uh, of cerumen or earwax pressing on the eardrum and irritating the, the, the tissues, and their ear just reacted to that by creating uh, tinnitus. Meniere's disease, I mentioned that's endolymphatic high drops, high fluid pressure. Who do we treat? Well, how do we treat that? Diuretics, a temporal mandibular joint disorder. These are people who have bruxism often. So bite plates can be very helpful or potentially going on to an oral surgeon who may need to do some reconstruction of the TMJ joint. Otosclerosis, um, those are people with the calcium deposits along the, the stapedial foot plate. Um, that we treat generally with a, with, a, uh, uh, with a supplement called Florical. It's a calcium and fluoride supplement. Uh, vascular malformations, again, those can go on and, and be surgically corrected or medications. One of the, another challenge is lots of times when individuals have had an injury of some type, they're going to have pain management issues. Um, you know, let's say again, this individual has been in, um, let's say it's a hockey, a hockey player who was skating at full speed and went into the boards, uh, was wearing their helmet, but still got a, a traumatic head injury from that. And in addition to that has significant spinal pain. Uh, you know, pain because of the pinched nerve going down their arm, they pinch the brachial plexus, all these other things. And right away, we need to get the pain management under control. So we find out that that person is either taking um, aspirin. Aspirin has a tendency to make either cause tinnitus, or if you have some tinnitus, make it worse. Um, Celebrex, that's another common uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory or NSAID, that can cause tinnitus, or if you have tinnitus, make it worse. So we need to realize that there may be medications that are treating other 
kind of coexisting symptoms with this patient that may be either causing their tinnitus or making it noticeably worse for them. So again, we, we, one of the things I always do when I'm doing these tinnitus evaluations is let's find out if it's any of these things going on here because we can fix that before we even have to get into any of the tinnitus retraining therapy that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, but if it isn't one of those things, then there are some other options available to the patient. Um, and again, I hear lots of patients come in and say, you know, I talked to my primary care about this and they said tinnitus is just something you have to learn to live with. Mm. Uh, we track our patients about 80% of the time we can either completely eliminate or significantly reduce tinnitus. So it isn't something they just necessarily have to live with, particularly if it's due to one of these conditions, because we can, con we can treat that condition and get rid of the tinnitus then as well. Okay, this is what I was me mentioning here. There are medications. The NSAIDs, uh, particularly um, Celebrex is a big one, but if you're taking high and consistent doses of ibuprofen or naproxen, those are also, uh, they do cause or worsen it. Um, acetosalicylic acid or aspirin or the other salicylates. Um, there are some other uh, salicylates that are in the pain killing family. Um, uh, even over the counter, if you look at some of them, if it has uh, salicylate in it, it is in the aspirin family and is going to be causing or worsening tinnitus. Um, individuals who have, uh, who have, who are on strong uh, diuretics like Lasix, um, uh, unlike uh, uh, the ones that we use to treat uh, Meniere's disease, that's usually um, that's usually a, a non-loop diuretic. It doesn't occur, have its effect at what's called the loop of Henle down in the kidneys. Lasix is a, is a powerful diuretic, but is ototoxic and also can cause tinnitus. Also, there are certain antibiotics such as vancomycin. Generally, if it ends in mycin, as long as it's uh, got mycin at the end of it, that is commonly an antibiotic that's gonna do some damage to the auditory system. Quinine, or things in the quinine family. Um, you know, the, uh, I think we, throughout uh, uh, COVID, you know, people were talking about uh, some of the anti-malarial agents as potentially having some antiviral effects that could be useful in, in COVID. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, quinoline and uh, hydroxy, oh, I can't remember which one that one was, but the quinine-based medications are also kind of ototoxic. They also tend to be kind of vestibulotoxic. We have to be a little careful about those because they do have a tendency to have people lose their balance as well. Um, chemotherapy drugs, uh, I have a number of patients that I track that have had cisplatin. Um, and that is a, a drug that's used in particular types of cancer. Uh, I'm uh, not an oncologist, but I, I know often it is used in um, kind of ovarian cancers and some of those types of cancers. And that is a pretty ototoxic medication, but for the, for the cancer, it's good for, it's very good for it. So they'll say it is worth, you know, the risk benefit profile is we may be causing some tinnitus to this patient or some hearing loss, but we're probably going to save their life. Alcohol is another one that is temporarily ototoxic. Lots of patients will say, you know, if I go out with my friends and have a couple of drinks, boy, my tinnitus is much worse. Um, and that's because the alcohol itself is uh, is toxic to those nerve endings. And again, the brain is aware of how much information it's getting from those nerve endings. And if those nerve endings uh, uh, start to fire off less, the tinnitus will then get worse. Okay. Um, Noise-induced hearing loss, very common reason. Uh, these are just causes for, um, for people to have the tinnitus, noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, individuals, presbycusis just means age-related hearing loss. Individuals who have fluid-filled middle ears, there's that otosclerosis and Meniere's disease again, the calcium deposits and the high fluid pressure in the ear. Earwax pressing against the eardrum can lead to this irritation, as can other foreign objects against the tympanic membrane. Um, again, there's the, there are the um, medications that can cause this, uh, and heavy metal poisoning too. I, had, I have one individual that we could not figure out why he had significant tinnitus. And I was going through all his medications. He didn't really have noise exposure and so on. Turned out he was carrying a lot of lead in his body. He had uh, heavy metal toxicity. Um, zinc deficiency, I'm a little careful about that one because where I did my, uh, my doctoral studies at Ohio State, there was a doctor there by the name of Dr. William Shambaugh 
and he was studying zinc deficiency for causes of, of tinnitus and found people who were zinc deficient, if you supplemented them with zinc, uh, their tinnitus would go away. The problem is, if you're not zinc deficient, taking extra zinc isn't going to make any difference at all. And it's interesting because he published that paper and boy, there was a real run on zinc supplements because everybody with ringing in their ears was hoping they were zinc deficient, but it was only that small subset that that would make a difference in. Um, individuals who have kind of high blood lipid levels, um, you know, high cholesterol, high triglycerides can lead to some um, restrictions in the blood flow going into the, uh, into the cochlea itself. And again, those restricted blood flows can lead to um, redu reduced neural responses of those nerve endings. Uh, which can, again, the brain can become aware of that and create the tinnitus. Diabetes kind of has a similar uh, pathology. It's, it tends to be a kind of a disease of small blood vessels. And as you start to limit some of the ability of the tympanic member of the uh, uh, cochlea to remain adequately perfused with blood um, through some of these metabolic conditions, you're going to see worsening tinnitus in those patients as well. Neurologic, right at the top, head trauma. Um, you know, we have all heard the term, you know, individual took a big hit while they were boxing or took a big hit when they were playing football and they got their bell rung. Um, that's a term that we will commonly use. Often that's indicative of an individual who has some concussion syndrome, but where the term they got their bell rung comes from is the fact that very commonly tinnitus occurs at that time because of either some damage in the peripheral nervous system or some abnormality that occurs in the temporal lobe in the central auditory nervous system. Uh, multiple sclerosis uh, can lead to that as well. Meningitis, um, which is you know, an basically a brain infection, if we wanna think of it that way. Uh, tumors along the auditory pathways, the two most common being what's called an acoustic neuroma, which is, a, which is a tumor that it grows along the, uh, the cochlear branch of the eighth cranial nerve. And if it grows along the vestibular branch or the balance branch of the eighth cranial nerve, it's typically referred to as a vestibular schwannoma. Uh, but those tumors can lead to worsening tinnitus as well. Uh, when I do an evaluation, those are things I'm trying to rule out as well because we have site of lesion tests for those space occupying lesions. As, as well as, of course, if somebody was um, had some kind of a space occupying lesion in their temporal lobe up in the up in the auditory cortex, those abnormalities in neural function can lead to tinnitus as well. But again, head trauma being probably the third most common cause behind noise exposure and advancing age. 90% of people who have tinnitus, I think I said 80% before, but probably 90%, the vast majority of people who have tinnitus, we find some hearing loss in them. Um, so Individuals will, will often come in here and say, geez, I've had ringing in my ears so long. I just thought that was, it's, they're supposed to do that. And really it's not a normal condition. Uh, people will ask again, if, it's, if these sounds are audible to other people. Lots of tinnitus patients will say to me, um, you know, when I first realized I had tinnitus, it was because I was asking someone else, did they hear that ringing? And they didn't. It, I was the only one that was doing this. Other people will, uh, uh, these are other questions I've had, which are, you know, can I expose myself to noise over time and essentially kind of like get calluses on my hands? Can I get calluses in my auditory system and make it so that noise won't lead to this damage? And the answer is no, you, you can't make your auditory system get tougher by, by exposing yourself to noise. Uh, and then how much noise is going to lead to some damage? Really anytime when the noise gets to be about mm, 85 to 90 decibels or louder, that's going to, uh, to lead to some noise. So again, in individuals who've been in a car accident and there's been an airbag deployment, that's more like about 150 to 160 decibels. That's again, a gunshot going off inside of a closed vehicle. Um, that absolutely is at a level where noise damage can be instantaneous and tinnitus can occur instantaneously as well with that. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Let's talk about treatment. Let's go, let's go down here. This is a little bit older data. Um, there are lots and lots of research articles out there. I should probably update this. There's probably you know, 25,000 of them out there uh, at this point. But things that, that individuals can do that are pretty non-invasive things. You know, If we can keep them away from noise, at least we're not likely to make the tinnitus get worse. 
um, coffee, tea, um, pops that have caffeines in them, in them, nicotine and so on, those have a tendency to increase. They tend to be slightly ototoxic, basically. Um, decreasing salt intake can get your fluid pressure levels down, which can, again, take the pressure off of those nerve endings. If there's a chance that there's any increased fluid pressure in those ears, um, that can help with, with reducing that. Individuals who are um, tired tend to have worse tinnitus. Um, individuals who, of course, as we've said, are on these ototoxic drugs are going to be uh, going to be uh, having worse tinnitus. And I was smiling because these are those every, this is something every doctor has told every patient, you know, cut that back on your coffee, cut back on your salt, eat more fruits and vegetables, get plenty of rest. Well, it's going to help everything. And certainly tinnitus is going to be somewhat, somewhat improved by that, or at least as much as we can without uh, more aggressive management. So um, again, I mentioned before, if we have fluid pressure problems like Meniere's disease, we can use diuretic. Um, for, for otosclerosis, we tend to use a supplement called Floracal for that. That can seal off those calcium uh, uh, ions that are leaking into the inner ear. If a person has a sudden hearing loss, I actually got a call just last night at home from a friend whose sister out of state had a sudden hearing loss. She just kind of lost her hearing. And one of the big things that we will suggest is get in right away and get on a steroid to try and knock that inflammation down because that will often give a faster recovery of both the hearing loss and the tinnitus if that happens. Um, so to about 2016, there was a huge um, consensus statement that came out. And this came out from the American Medical Association, the American uh, Speech and Hearing Association, the American Academy of Audiology, and the uh, uh, College of Otolaryngologists, I believe, kind of got their experts on tinnitus together and said, Can, is there anything that the research shows us we, is, has a good chance of working for these patients? And the answer is, number one, hearing aids. Now, why does that make good sense? Obviously, if the brain becomes aware of a reduction in hearing, as I showed you that audiogram earlier, we're at 6,000 hertz, there was a pretty significant decline in that person's hearing. If we can return their hearing to normal now, that's gonna be like you shaking your foot away. Your brain says, hey, the auditory information has now been returned to me. And therefore, in about 40% of cases, just by returning their hearing to normal, the tinnitus will go away. So uh, if an individual, again, has some kind of a traumatic head injury, uh, and we find out that that coexists with hearing loss, our first thing we're going to try is let's try and close that uh, hearing loss down. Let's try and return that auditory sensitivity to normal. And we're gonna have you know, around a 50-50 chance of, of that improving or eliminating that tinnitus. The second thing that can be done is people will use what are called masking devices. Um, and some of these are pretty expensive. They're kind of cumbersome. But there, one is called what's called the neuromonics device, and it's something that people can wear and adjust um, these sounds until they can basically cause their tinnitus to be masked out. So I'm not a big I, I'm not a big fan of maskers because number one they're expensive, number two they're kind of cumbersome, and number three you have to turn them up to a level where you just kind of can't hear the tinnitus. And it's really kind of replacing one sound they don't like with another sound that maybe they just don't like a little bit less. So I'm not a big fan of maskers, but I am a big fan of tinnitus retraining therapy. Um, and we can now do that. Tinnitus retraining therapy is the use of sound therapy, but it's different kinds of sounds that we will use to convince the brain that someone else is now either kind of creating tinnitus or is, is stimulating the fibers along that neural pathway. So we commonly will use, what, what's really nice is when we find a person with a hearing loss and tinnitus, because we can use the same devices. We can order hearing instruments that have tinnitus retraining therapy sounds built into them. Um, and some of the more simple devices out there only have one or two different sounds. The more advanced systems out there, which really are not more expensive, in some cases even less expensive, can have as many as 20 different sounds that we can try to 
uh, to train the brain that someone else is stimulating those neural pathways and you no longer have to do this. What's nice about tinnitus retraining therapy is you do not have to bring the sound up to the level that you're masking out the tinnitus. So when I do this with my patients, I will tell them the quietest sound you can hear. When we're doing a hearing test and you're pushing the button when you barely hear a sound or you raise your hand when you just barely can tell something is there, we're gonna give that a number one for its loudness. My voice is a number five. I want you to tell me when I've adjusted this tinnitus retraining sound until it's about a two. So I want it a little above what they can barely hear, but well below the level of my voice. So, and we can use lots of different kinds of sounds with this. What I will typically do is I will use a broadband noise uh, and it's a broadband noise that stimulates all the neural pathways and is what's called amplitude modulated. So this will sound very much almost like waves on a seashore where you're hearing this, this broadband sound that gets a little louder and a little softer. But again, it's very, very quiet, just above the level they can barely hear. So that's one of the sounds I'll use. Another sound I will use is a narrow band noise that is basically designed to be one half octave above and one half octave below the frequency at which they perceive their tinnitus. So I will create a narrow band noise now uh, not a broadband noise that stimulates all the neural pathways, but this one is only stimulating the neural pathways that's kind of nearby since the auditory system is organized by frequency or pitch. These are the neural fibers that are very nearby the most damaged ones where they are hearing their tinnitus. So that's the second sound that I'll give them. Then I will usually give them what's called a fractal tone. Um, what a fractal tone is, it sounds very much like a wind chime. It's basically this random, uh, amplitude or, or loudness changing and frequency changing or pitch changing sound. Uh, and again, the easiest way I can describe it is it sounds kind of like a, like a wind chime and it's very, very faint. Uh, and the idea is for some people, if the sound is unpredictable to their auditory system, that seems to, to suppress the tinnitus uh, somewhat more. And then I do a fractal tone mixed with a generally a broadband sound. Um, so I usually give them five different conditions, just filling in their hearing loss, uh, a broadband noise that changes its loudness, a narrow band noise that doesn't change its loudness, but is very near their tinnitus, uh, a fractal tone that has essentially the characteristics of kind of like a wind chime, and then a fractal tone and a broadband sound mixed together. And the nice thing about those devices that I use is I have about 20 of these different stimuli I can use. So if after a couple of weeks, they aren't getting relief from their tinnitus by trying these different stimuli, we can try different ones and see if we can track into something that will work. And if we can correct their hearing and we can do tinnitus retraining therapy, we have about an 80% success rate in complete elimination or significant reduction of tinnitus. Um, and then the number four is cognitive behavioral therapy. This would be done by a psychologist. So if there is somebody that we have just not been able to get, you know, we've done everything we can to sort of manage their medication to, see, to make sure that's not uh, the cause of the tinnitus. Um, we've looked at, uh, you know, any other um, coexisting things, lifestyle changes that can be made. Uh, and then we've treated their hearing loss. And then we've done tinnitus retraining sounds and they're in that 20% that we were just getting no response from. We can refer those on to psychology. Um, and particularly if they're comfortable with doing cognitive behavioral therapy, where in, the, in this case, the tinnitus isn't really going away, but the patient is learning to not be bothered by it or essentially to put it in some cognitive space where it's just not, it's just almost like an intractable pain. They know they have it, but they put it into a place where they can ignore it. Um, and so that becomes more of a more of a psychological therapy approach. And those four things uh, have been shown to work. We use really number one and number three in my clinic. Again, I don't like the masters simply because they do nothing for the hearing loss. They tend to be a little expensive and, and a little kind of kludgy, um, but we can do the tinnitus retraining therapy sounds with the hearing aids kind of embedded within the same technology. Um, some possibilities that are out there, um, th there is some research that people say they have gotten some 
relief from getting acupuncture. The problem is the studies are not well um, defined. They're not well controlled. Um, so there may be a placebo effect going on there where people go and get acupuncture and have an expectation that they will have a relief from the tinnitus. Therefore, they say afterwards, yeah, my tinnitus is still there, but it's less bothersome to me. But that was one other area that they said is a possibility. Electrical stimulation, back in the 1980s, I was working with the Veterans Administration back in Cleveland. Uh, we were working on what was called alpha stimulation. It was electrical stimulation of the acupuncture points on the ear. And again, we had some people that thought it helped, but it just was never very consistent. Some of these other uh, things that we'll see, ear candling, lipoflavonoids, essential oils, and adjustments, chiropractic adjustments, no evidence really that any of those work. Um, you know, the chiropractic adjustment, we'll have people that sometimes say, but it seems to be better afterwards. I'm not gonna talk someone out of that if they feel as though they're getting relief, but there just hasn't been really any research that shows that's going to be you know, we're essentially going through the, um, through the, through the skull. These are not spinal nerves, basically. And these are, these are up in the upper kind of central auditory nervous system. So adjustments and so on just don't seem to be effective at changing that. But those are things that you'll see other people saying, you know, I saw an article in a newspaper and it said all I had to pay was shipping and handling and I could get these pills and I could try them. Where those tend to come from, by the way, the data that they say it works is about 75%, and I didn't say this earlier, about 75% of people who have tinnitus from a head injury, it will go away on its own in about three months. So about 75% of the time, it will actually abate um, as the healing process is going on and so on in about, within about three months. So often what happens is an individual was going to get better anyway, and they do some treatment uh, and if they are getting better and they're taking the treatment, they will often attribute their improved function to that treatment. So, you know, let's say, you know, a month after they get the tinnitus, they respond to an ad, they get these lipoflavonoids, it takes a few weeks to come in, they start taking them, and a month later, the tinnitus goes away. Well, this person will be glad to give you a testimonial that says the lipoflavonoids got rid of my tinnitus. Unfortunately, in a well-designed study, there would be people who would be getting sugar pills. And if the same number of people, the tinnitus went away, we knew that was just what was going to happen anyway. So again, those are, those are treatments that are out there, but the only one that maybe has some potential is probably acupuncture. Oh, there's the end of my slideshow. Um, so to kind of summarize this, what, what I would like your takeaway to be is that tinnitus is very common. About 40 million people have tinnitus in the United States. Um, tinnitus is very bothersome. Um, people are about eight times more likely to go get help for tinnitus than they will for hearing loss. And again, when I explain that to people, I say, well, you're more likely to probably take your shoe off if you've got a pebble in your shoe than you are to worry about it that the laces are too tight. And maybe your, your foot's a little bit numb because this is a noxious um, basically a noxious stimulus that you'd really like to get rid of. Um, about 25% of those 40 million people, um, this is bad enough that it's affecting their quality of life. So they're gonna seek out treatment for this. Um, the number one cause is noise exposure. Number two cause is advancing age and probably what's happened to people as their age has advanced, the, the various diseases they've been exposed to and maybe medications and so on. Third most common is trauma to the head which leads to either trauma to the peripheral or the central auditory nervous system. Where the tinnitus is coming the vast majority of the time from is the central auditory nervous system. So this is not typically objective tinnitus, probably 95% of the time, this is tinnitus that only the person who experiences it can hear. Um, for individuals that have head injury, uh, again, we know that there's a fair amount of healing that can go on, but when I said 76% of them, it will go away in about, at about three months, that also means about 25% of them, it's not going to go away. So this is now a permanent condition that they've, that they've developed that we need to be cognizant of and hopefully getting them treatment for. Um, there's lots of things we can do that can make the tinnitus worse. Um, we can be exposed to more noise. We can have kind of a high salt, unhealthy diet. Uh, we can take medications that tend to be somewhat ototoxic. Um, those are all things that can make it worse. What can make it better? 
well, there are some, you know, some kind of living a cleaner life type things that individuals can do. I certainly would be uh, having them discuss with their primary care, are there modifications in their medication that they can take that may lead to some improvements in their tinnitus. But for that, you know, that, that 25% of, of people who are having significant problems from their tinnitus, um, I think we know that number one, if it coexists with the hearing loss, which it does about 90% of the time, we can treat the hearing loss and about 40% of those patients, the tinnitus goes away with nothing else except kind of filling in that notch in their hearing. Uh, to improve the odds to about 80%, we need to do some kind of tinnitus retraining therapy. And there's a number of different ways we can do it. The devices I tend to use at my clinic give us a choice of a whole host of different things we can try. Again, some of the hearing aids just have a simple kind of broadband sound. Well, if, if it works, great, but if it doesn't work, there's nothing else we can really try there. One of the reasons I like the devices we use here is number one, they're not very expensive. And number two, they've got more like 25 different things that we can try. And the patient can leave with an app that can allow them to try some different things also. So some of the reasons that people sometimes feel like they're doing better is they have a little control over their tinnitus then. Um, the next thing I would want you to remember is um, that when people say things like, um, you know, this is, this is really affecting my quality of life. I am anxious. I am depressed. Um, I am potentially suicidal. I have certainly had, particularly when I worked for the VA, I had patients that had had a, an explosion nearby and, and gave them incredibly, incredibly bad tinnitus. And I would do a tinnitus matching paradigm and find out that they were walking around hearing 80 decibels worth of this sound in their ear 24 seven. And they would say, if you can't help me, I don't think I can live like this. So this can be something that really does have a change in individual's quality of life. Um, uh, but the other thing is, I, I always like to give them hope and say, you know, we've got about an 80% chance to get this under control for you. And if we can't, it's not going to be for a lack of trying. We're going to do everything in our power to try and do this. And if we can't get it taken care of, and we haven't been able to get the medications regulated in some way, again, then we can refer them on to maybe get some uh, psychological therapy to help them kind of put this in a place where it doesn't really bother them. So again, a frustration I'll sometimes have is, you know, a patient will walk in and say, well, I guess I'm here, but you know, everybody else I've talked to said, there's nothing you can do about this. It's just really not the case. Um, there's probably not a pill you can take that's gonna make it go away. Um, there's probably not, uh, you know, an exercise you can do like you can do for certain kinds of vertigo and so on, it's gonna make it go away. But if we can get the hearing loss, we can convince the brain those nerves are firing again. And if we can convince the brain that, that those neural pathways have been activated through some of the tinnitus retraining sounds, uh, that is, that's going to give us our best chance. And by the way, one example I didn't give you um, is if any of you have ever had a TENS unit used on you, I have a, I have kind of a gamey shoulder from years and years of use. And one of the things my physical therapist does is, is I'll go there and they'll put little electrical stimulation through the, the neural pathways from my shoulder, just feels like a tickle, but my pain immediately goes away. Well, something else is using that pathway now. So the brain is not perceiving it as pain, but perceiving that as a little bit of a tickle. That's kind of like some of the tinnitus retraining sound ideas is we are putting a different non-noxious stimulus through those auditory pathways. And suddenly the brain says, I don't have to make this tinnitus anymore because someone else is out there using those pathways now. So, so anyway, so hopefully that would be what you'd feel like you could get as a takeaway from this talk today. Uh, and I guess if there's any questions, I, I think I've got some time. I, I'm not real great at watching my clock. That's okay. So. You're, yep. You're at 2.45. Um, I don't know. Um, we got a comment in the chat that said this was very informative, well put together, and easy to follow. A lot of new awesome. information to me. Thank you so much. And I would echo exactly what she said. I agree. It was very interesting. Good. Questions for him? You can type in the chat. You can unmute yourself. You were so thorough. I don't think I have any because you've covered all. Okay. Hobby. I have another quick, quick, funny story. Just a super quick one. One time I was an expert witness in a, um, in a malpractice, or I'm sorry, in a workers comp case. And it had to do with tinnitus and hearing loss. And, and so I was kind of going through the descriptions of what it is and so on. 
And, and at the end of, the, of my testimony, I said, well, that, you know, I'm done. Can I be excused, Your Honor? And the judge said to me, hold on just a second. I have tinnitus and just started <laughs> asking me questions. So oh, I thought that, that was kind of funny. So Yeah, that's and, hilarious. Yeah, that's cute. Funny. Holly, did you have a question? She unmuted it. Yeah, I was trying to type it, but I'm not really sure what I'm trying to type. So I'll just try to say it. Okay. Um, so I'm a vocational rehabilitation counselor, and a lot of times people will go for an evaluation and then we'll get something back that says, okay, this hearing aid offers comfort and echo and comfort and noise and speech and noise and calm situation. Is one of those the, the, um, okay. And it is retraining sounds. Excellent question. There we go. Yeah. Thank the, you. The answer is, the answer is that it's, that's different. Um, as a matter of fact, when, when I hear that, that's probably, it sounds like a Phonak hearing aid. And of course, I'm familiar with kind of all the companies that make hearing aids. And what those are, Holly, are those are actual acoustic environments that the processor in the hearing instrument is able to pick up and change its hearing aid settings as those environments switch. So okay. what, what they have, that might've been a Unitron actually, comfort and quiet and so on. I'm just thinking of the different menus of the software. So the idea there is, um, I, I, it makes me think back when I first got into this field 38 years ago, I remember one of my first patients was a good friend of mine. I played football in college with him and his grandmother came to me and I fit her with hearing aids. And he asked me the question at the time. He said, now that you've got her hearing well in this environment, how is she going to do when she goes and gets in the car or goes to church or goes home or goes to the grocery store? And I told him, I said, Tom, at this point, the technology is such that we just kind of take our best guess and hope it kind of works everywhere. But now what's happened, Holly, is the computers have gotten powerful enough and smart enough that they know what it sounds like in a typical car or they know what it okay. sounds like outside when it's a windy day or they know what it sounds like when you're watching television, let's say. And so those are what are called environments. And so the hearing aid will actually switch to those different environments and process their sound. So that's really from a hearing standpoint um, in a different way to optimize their hearing for that acoustical environment. Where the tinnitus retraining sounds are, that's in a different menu. And they will then allow them to do things like present like a broadband noise or a broadband noise that changes in its amplitude and so on. So those things you were talking about are really more on the hearing side of the hearing aid, not the tinnitus retraining sound of the hearing aid. Okay. What would that look like if it were on a phone act hearing aid? Would that be in that list of features? Yeah, it wouldn't be in those environments or wouldn't be in those um, those uh, listening environments. There's a separate menu that says, I believe in a phone act hearing aid, it says, um, I think it says tinnitus, uh, tinnitus, it, it, it says tinnitus sound or tinnitus retraining sound. And you go into that menu and it'll say, do you want a pink noise, a brown noise, a white noise? Those are just different kind of uh, shapes of noises. Or do you want to create a noise that's shaped to their hearing loss? In other words, one that's going to have more energy in the high frequencies, less energy in the low frequencies where they don't have much hearing loss, looking at that earlier audiogram that I showed you. So that would be in a, on, the, on their software, they would have an actual kind of submenu that would say tinnitus sounds in it. But the other ones are what are called the environments is what they were telling you. And what they're, what they're really saying with those environments is it sounds like they're describing you know, that this person needs a somewhat more sophisticated hearing solution because they're in lots of different, you know, they aren't a retired person sitting. And of course, they wouldn't be a candidate, they wouldn't be a client of yours if they're retired and sitting in a nursing home in a room. Um, right. but they're, they're in lots of different listening environments. So that person is telling you, hey, this, this hearing aid can process sound differently in those environments. But that would be the hearing side, not the tinnitus side of that equipment. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it was a great question. Yeah, very interesting. Anyone else have a question? That was a, that would have been a tough one to type out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad yeah. How it asked me. A lot of times I could kind of, as I hear them asking, it kind of help, you know, I, I kind of know where that's coming from. But sure. uh, yeah, you, you had to help with the words even verbally asking the questions. <laughs> so I never would have typed it. Yeah, no, you did great. Anybody else out there? 
Bueller. <laughs> yeah. Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> I think we're good. It doesn't look like yeah, it looks good. good. Looks like everybody sounded yeah. cool. You know, I'm I glad to hear you. that there's hope out there because I have had so many clients tell me, like, they tell me there's nothing they can do. So now Absolutely. I'm like, I'm gonna send them your this now and say no. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. really, this is yeah. it, it is it is it's not a for sure thing. I still, I mean, done, done this a long time. Yeah, uh, you know, 38 years now. Gosh, that went fast. <laughs> um, and I can tell you that you know, sometimes I'll have patients come in that I can't believe we got their tinnitus under control because they'll have like Meniere's disease. Meniere's is tough because the tinnitus will change as the fluid pressure changes. And it sometimes is roaring and sometimes they have real intolerance for loud sounds and so on. And so these patients will come back and I'll say, you know, how's your tinnitus? And they'll say, oh, it's gone. And they're just like, I'm about ready to do backflips, you know, in the, <laughs> in the lobby. And they're just like, and I'm like, you can't believe how exciting that is. And they're like, ah. <laughs> I, figured, I figured you could do it. And I'm like, you know what? I kind of didn't. So, yeah. so it's funny because, you know, sometimes there are ones that, that even I have, you know, the thought that this is kind of a yes, limited yeah. prognosis, but, uh, sure. but, but I also don't want to overpromise and under deliver. I never want a patient to come in and say, no, okay, we'll get rid of it for you. But I'll tell right. them, you know what? We have an 80% chance. And if we can't do it, it's not for a lack of trying. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, you bet. Peace yeah, it was fun. All right. Thanks, everybody, for Good joining. Thanks, thanks for taking the time to join us on a See webinar. You all in a few weeks. <laughs>